and Senate. So in conclusion, policies enacted by Congress really do make a significant impact on our ability to raise money to, to do the work that we're doing to try to develop these life-saving life uh, potential therapies uh, in biotechnology. So we thank you for your work in that regard, and we ask you to continue to support the type of legislation that will support that kind of innovation. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Mensah, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the Joint Economic Committee. I'm pleased to be here at Lisa Mensah as President and CEO of the Opportunity Finance Network. I represent a network of community development financial institutions. Those are mission-driven community banks and credit unions, loan funds and venture capital funds who are all investing to create a strong economy. CDFIs fill the market gaps that you've both mentioned, and public sector support for this role is critical. Key federal programs help CDFIs assure that more communities, including those in rural and native and persistently poor areas, have access to the capital and the chance to participate in the innovation economy. A few months ago, I attended the 40th anniversary of Coastal Enterprises, a CDFI located in rural Maine, and actually in Portland, Maine, that serves rural businesses throughout the state. And at this celebration, I met Telson Technology Management, a Portland-based IT company that uh, builds broadband infrastructure across the US. And Telson was founded by an Army veteran, Josh Broder. It started with only three people in 2007, and by 2013, it had grown to 50 people. But then they got stuck. They needed financing to expand. And so that's when Tilson turned to Coastal Enterprises for an initial round of capital. And it enabled the company to grow now to over 230 employees in now eight locations. Subsequently, the company expanded and its investor base went beyond Coastal to many other range of private sector investors. So Tilson is not only creating jobs, they're building that vital physical infrastructure that Senator Heinrich mentioned broadband networks. As the JEC report, Investing in Rural America, notes, more than one-third of rural residents currently lack access to broadband, impeding them from reaching new markets and growing businesses. So small businesses like Telson turn to CDFIs when they can't access capital from traditional lenders. Telson's technology success is really just one example of the way that CDFIs are spurring the economy and encouraging entrepreneurship. But there's a challenge of small businesses. Since the recession, the availability of capital for small businesses has contracted, and credit standards have tightened. Small business loan originations are 30% below their 2007 levels, and rural areas are especially hard hit. Small business lending in rural communities remains less than half of what it was in 2004. And in fact, when you adjust for inflation, lending to rural small businesses is below 1996 levels. But CDFIs are hyper-local financial institutions with a proven ability to reach deep into hard-to-serve rural and native and persistently poor communities. When formal credit markets for small business contract, CDFIs step up to meet the needs of businesses not well served by those traditional financial institutions. And during periods of economic contraction, like the Great Recession, CDFIs play a counter-cyclical role. Between 2007 and 2009, while SBA 7A lending contracted, by more than 35%, CDFI business lending actually grew by more than 26%. So I'm here today to commend the Congress for its continued support of federal small business lending programs that expand the CDFI capacity to help small businesses succeed. And my recommendation today is for Congress to sustain and enhance federal programs that bring about the kind of innovation economy we need. I have three recommendations. First, I urge a continuation of the 250 million appropriation the Department of Treasury's CDFI fund. For every dollar awarded by a CDFI fund, a CDFI is able to make $12 in investment. Second, at the Small Business Administration, I urge you to make permanent the Community Advantage Program. And finally, at the Department of Agriculture, I urge full funding for rural development small business lending programs. Now, what do these big federal programs look like on the ground? Well, in New Mexico, because of the Treasury's CDFI fund, Axion New Mexico can lend to native-owned small businesses, like the I Need Sugar Bakery and other micro enterprises. And in St. Paul, Minnesota, because of this SBA's Community Advantage Program, MEDA can offer its line of credit to Formula, a minority-owned architectural business, allowing it to reach its full growth potential. And in South Dakota, because of the USDA, the Lakota Fund 
can provide financing to help the Lafferty Fund family on the Rosebed Reservation expand one of the only native-owned cattle businesses. The federal government is such a vital partner to CDFIs, helping to close the market gaps that prevent too many Americans from participating in the innovation economy. And that's why I'm here, and I look forward to a continued dialogue and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all of your uh, testimony and your being here this morning. With that, we'll begin the questioning period. And uh, for our members, I'll just begin. Uh, Mr. McIntosh, uh, you uh, mentioned in your testimony you've talked about the concerning decline in IPOs, which uh, negatively impacts the entire economy. And if Congress can't help address this problem with legislation that eases the burden imposed by Sarbanes-Oxley, um, it's going to have a long-term impact. What do you think that long-term impact will be? Do you think this will have – what will it have on technological progress, economic growth here in the United States without attention to this? Um, so I think there's two aspects to that question. Um, one is the fact that the investors themselves in America won't have access to a lot of these companies unless they start to invest money offshore. Um, and in fact, we're actually starting to see that trend play out already. So if you look at mutual fund holdings over the last 10 or so years, there's been around about $1.5 trillion coming out of U.S. mutual funds, and a third of that has gone back into equities overseas. So I think one of the problems that you might have is that U.S. investors buying U.S. companies aren't going to have access to the growth, which is going to be worse for their retirement savings. The second thing is that the companies that end up IPOing overseas where the environment's better are more likely to grow their businesses overseas, have head offices overseas, and that's going to affect employment. And it's eventually, to your point, going to affect um, where the technology resides and where the IP resides as well. Um, and, and from that, like I think the industries and the network effect as well of the, the IP and the sophisticated developments being overseas will make it harder for us to keep up and catch up. Uh, Ms. King, speaking of intellectual property um, and a lot of the work, in the background that you have, you talked about long-term uh, investments. Uh, you also mentioned Section 382 uh, of the tax code that was put in place to prevent companies from acquiring operations that lose money just to offset their taxable income. But it also represents an impediment to startups that have no tax liability and then accumulate net operating losses. I've been concerned about this issue for a while. You mentioned a number of bipartisan initiatives in, in your testimony. Uh, speaking of Section 382, um, the legislation that I'm working on right now to address this problem would help the, the disadvantaged side of the startup community, particularly technology startups that conduct that valuable research with the potential to help improve and maybe even save lives. It's unfair to those companies and then damaging to the overall economy that uh, discourages investment in, in innovation. So while Section 382 was intended to prevent loss trafficking, how should we weigh its benefits against the costs that have been borne largely by startups. Yeah, the, and thank you for your work on this because this is in fact something that's really critical and we've actually had to address this in the context of some of the financing that we've done at, at Glycomimetics. So the, the problem, as you point out, is that you, don't, you want to prevent what is known as this lost trafficking, but what you don't want to prevent is smaller companies raising money which also sometimes results in significant ownership changes through the natural course of investors coming in and out of a company like ours that's the kind of situation where we want to be able to preserve our net operating losses because we hope someday to be profitable and to be able to use them. We don't want to discourage the kind of investment that needs to come into, um, into companies like ours that have to raise a lot of money from a number of different investors. So um, I think the objective of uh, preventing trafficking in, L in NOLs is, is a reasonable objective, but we really don't want to inhibit the ability of companies like ours to raise the significant capital that we raise that also could inadvertently be uh, prevented by the law that by this uh, section 382. Would you like to see legislation accomplishing accomplish anything in particular in this area? Um, and, and what effect do you predict it would have if, if we were able to move something forward on capital formation? Well, yeah, we, what we don't want to we, what we don't want to do is we don't want to discourage large investments in companies like ours. And so I think when we look at these reforms, we have to be very careful, as I know you are, to look at specifically uh, continuing to encourage investment without limiting the ability for companies to retain those NOLs for future uses. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Mensah, you mentioned several recommendations that you had with the Small Business Administration continuing appropriations for CDFIs. Um, do you sense continued bipartisan support, or what other message would you have for us as we go through the appropriations process and focus on some of these initiatives right now? I think these initiatives, the three recommendations that I raised, all have bipartisan support, particularly at the CDFI fund. 
We were so pleased to see Congress uh, move forward, and I urge this bipartisan continuation. I had the privilege to meet with the Small Business Administrator, who said, we are aligned. that This program needs to move from pilot to permanent. And the Department of Agriculture has traditionally been a heavily bipartisan. So I see no losers here in doubling down just when the economy needs a push into the very areas that don't rise easily with market forces. So I, I look forward to seeing more bipartisan work into your leadership in encouraging this. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fensa, you, in your last comment, you, you brought up something that really keeps me up at night, and that is as we have come out of uh, the recession of 2009, 2010, and the, the Great Recession, as they called it, um, the response to that has been fairly robust in the coasts and in urban areas. Uh, that, that recovery has not extended to every part of our country, and I think you know, the thing that worries me the most is us falling back into recession before uh, many of those communities can, can see the full benefit of this recovery. Um, I want to ask you about um, one thing in particular. I've got a number of team members who are meeting with small businesses in New Mexico this week to learn about the sort of current state of the challenges that they face. And one of the things that you, you mentioned in your testimony is just the, the very real challenge is that when you have bank closures and co consolidations, and those have accelerated in recent years, um, it really has left a lot of high need communities in the lurch. What does it mean? Can you speak to the, what the absence of a physical bank presence in a community means to the ability uh, to access capital and to develop um, new business plans? Thank you, Senator. I think the absence of a physical bank, you, you lose two things. You lose trusted relationships you lose human beings who can talk with you even if there's a turn down. You lose connections for, for firms. And you, you lose a regulated approach to uh, providing uh, capital. And while we uh, applaud new moves in technology, we, we, we regret those loss of tight connections. Where the CDFI field can step in is to become the partners Many, many bank CDFI partnerships exist. And so, but it's clear that particularly in our rural areas, when you see it's a people touch and it's a fairness and it's someone to talk through, it's ex additional expertise that I think we, is a social capital to this that we miss. How does that CDFI role change in those places I mentioned that are, that are banking deserts where we no longer have a, a credit union, we no longer have a community bank, that is playing that, that trusted role of somebody that, that you know in your community and you can go um, access capital through? CDFIs, I think of as the Swiss Army knives of a local economy. They're able, they're mission driven, so they're able to take time. They can often make the loan, like in my example of Coastal, when other, uh, when other financing sources aren't yet ready to play. So they have time, they have ingenuity, they can, they can build portfolios. We estimate that even amongst our own memberships, we've been lending over uh, $50 billion uh, as, a, as a network, cumulatively. And so it's not a little field. It's a serious field with balance sheets ready to help the kind of small businesses uh, that we're talking about. So a CDFI steps in, partners, gets those businesses to uh, permanent larger markets like what we've been talking about here. So I see it as part of the growth, and I commend you yeah. for your concern about those parts of the economy that didn't rise yet and that will need to be given an extra push. We do know what to do. One, one of those places, and, and there's a whole lot of overlap, but rural communities and tribal communities face some of the same, same challenges here, and one of them is obviously uh, the lack of the, the physical uh, connection to parts of the economy that are thriving to be able to access those markets. So broadband connection in particular, if you don't have it, it really does cut you off from all sorts of avenues to growth. Uh, do you have thoughts for how we do a better job of making sure that those tribal communities, those rural communities, how much of a, a governor is that on, on growth in the places that haven't yet seen this recovery? I'm so glad to have mentioned our rural areas and our tribal areas. 
and the very core infrastructure. As I saw in my time in the Department of Agriculture, broadband, is, broadband infrastructure is one of the things that is critical. It's critical not only for our students and our elders to learn, but it is critical for businesses to be able to sell. You have the titles that exist, both uh, and significant ones at the Department of Agriculture. So I think there's a bipartisan moment. And I believe CDFIs are here to be partners to both the construction, the, uh, the furthering of broadband infrastructure. And I see it as one of the true ways I saw uh, agreement on this to keep building in that final mile. They call it the last mile in, in broadband. Ms. King, do you want to add just a real short statement on venture capital with your experience? How can we do a better job of making that venture capital available to more geographically? Uh, when you made the comment about the, um, the geographies, I, that also struck close to my heart because it's true that even for companies like ours, which are, are somewhat larger um, than the very small ones you're talking about in the rural areas, even for us, uh, getting venture capital outside of those major cities is a, is a significant concern. I think we can do things like what we're talking about in terms of improving access to capital because this is the type of thing that helps really any company located anywhere. So if we're talking about, for example, the um, the 404B legislation that we're looking at, at um, exempting us from. Um, these, these things that help to support the emerging growth companies in general will, I think, increase the flow of capital to other regions around the country. And I think that is a critical issue. Uh, many of the things that come out of, or that support biotech companies come out of federal labs. I think things that come out of federal labs that need to get that financing to get over that hurdle, I think, can certainly be helped with the type of legislation we're talking about to improve capital access generally. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and uh, recognize the, the Vice Chairman, Senator Lee, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, there's an old saying in politics that goes something like this, and it, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. Uh, the trick being to pass uh, at least some of the cost of government along to someone who either doesn't vote or can't vote or is imperceptible to the common voter. In some ways, our corporate tax system hides taxes and ends up being a fairly regressive tax, one that's paid for by poor and middle class Americans, even without their knowing about it. They pay higher prices on goods and services, basically everything they purchase as a result of corporate taxes. They sometimes pay for it through diminished wages, unemployment, and underemployment. It does end up being paid for one way or another, uh, to a significant degree by America's poor and middle class. It's one of the reasons why in the past I've proposed the idea of eliminating the corporate tax and replacing the revenue lost from that uh, by taxing capital gains as ordinary income. In my view, this policy would accomplish uh, a few things. Number one, I think it would make the United States uh, one of the most competitive and attractive places in the world uh, for people to invest their money. Um, and uh, number two, I think it would also help free up the workers' share of the uh, businesses' corporate tax expenses. In addition to this, we can see other, uh, other benefits uh, by way of um, making the market more efficient and therefore reducing the pass-through price on goods and services, wages, unemployment, and underemployment that consumers ultimately experience. Uh, so, Mr. McIntosh, I'd like to ask you, do you think this, this sort of um, corporate integration tax policy uh, would impact the competitiveness of the United States uh, when it comes to decisions on, on where, when, and how to, to locate workers? I think tax policy is definitely an incentive uh, that will redirect investments. Uh, and I think that uh, we should try to encourage people to invest in, in companies. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that workers, and ideally as we go towards the future, workers' retirements are more self-funded and their investments are coming from investments in companies and enlisted companies and the growth of those companies. Um, so you want to make sure that the taxes on those company earnings and also on the distributions of those company earnings and the returning of capital and returning of the profits back to the investors are also not excessively taxed. Um, so I, I think that that's one of the more important things as well to, to consider is that the workers that we're talking about protecting also have savings. Ideally, they'd have even more savings. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't overtax the savings that they have as well. 
for the last, uh, for centuries, um, traditional brick and mortar manufacturing has served as the primary source for building tools, for infrastructure, transportation, for technology. Um, but today we've got a lot of advances in automation that are changing that. Certain technologies, including things like 3D printing, um, are pointing us toward a future in which we can imagine the end consumer uh, being able, uh, I in some ways, to manufacture their own toys, their own houses, or at least major components thereof. Um, and even things like prosthetic limbs, uh, simply by plugging in a few inputs to the right machine. Uh, what can you tell us about how this might impact our economy, how, how things like 3D printing, um, how this might affect workers uh, in manufacturing industries like uh, automobile manufacturing assembly, food processing, and so forth? I guess my expertise is not in manufacturing, but from the perspective of automation and uh, the markets, there's definitely been huge cost savings brought to the stock market and to a lot of markets because of automation. Um, the stock markets themselves, uh, especially in America, are one of the most transparent and electronic and, and equal and cheap to trade markets. Uh, so I think that automation has brought a lot of change to the stock markets, but that's been overwhelmingly good for investors. And because it's been good for investors, it's been overwhelmingly good in terms of the microstructure for trading for the issuers that are trying to list their stocks as well. America has some of the tightest spreads um, and the, the lowest volatility uh, across all of the markets in the world. One more question, if that's OK. Um, Ms. King, the Food and Drug Administration plays a pretty critical role when it comes to innovation in both food and medicine. Um, I'm personally a strong supporter of the right to try concept, um, and I'm hopeful for the results uh, of, of uh, uh, policies like that and, and what they can bring. W what, in your opinion, um, are some other reforms to drug policy that we should pursue in order to ensure that we're striking the right balance between the need for regulation uh, while also promoting innovation and, and protecting health? Yeah. Well, I think I, I, I would say that I strongly support a strong and effective FDA, and I think that that's one of the things that has enabled our industry to really uh, deliver what we think are the gold standard for um, regulatory approval. So I think having a strong FDA is critically important. And I do think we need to maintain the, um, the standards that the FDA has in terms of giving their drug approvals. Some of the things that have been instituted recently, for example, I mentioned the FIDASIA law in my, um, in my testimony, which enabled the FDA to grant breakthrough therapy status. Um, that's an example of something that gives the agency and gives companies like ours an opportunity to work closely with them during the development process in order to streamline um, the regulatory process. So I think uh, to the extent that we're able to continue to streamline that process, improve communications, improve the FDA's ability to hire and retain the critical people that they need, those are the kinds of things that I think can continue to ensure that we get a gold standard that we can have confidence in and that we get Delivery, and that we're able to deliver cures rapidly to the patients who can benefit from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Maloney. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for calling this hearing and all of our panelists. Uh, capital is the, the lifeblood of our businesses, as one of our witnesses, Mr. McIntosh, said today. And the United States has the deepest, most liquid, and most efficient capital markets in the world, end quote. And I am very proud to represent uh, NASDAQ and, and also the city of New York, one of the greatest uh, financial centers in the world. But not all businesses can access the capital they need to grow and create jobs. So this is particularly true uh, for small businesses in underserved areas, as the ranking member's report uh, recently showed. They depend on small banks and institutions that support them. And I'll get to my questions on that. But first, I'd, I'd like to address a claim that we've heard so often, and even in this hearing, that Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street reform, that Sar Sarbanes-Oxley reform, and the Consumer Protection Act has severely limited business le lending and access to capital. I would say that this is false. In fact, as this slide shows, uh, business lending has increased 75% since the passage 
of, of Dodd-Frank. Uh, it, it's now at, a, a, at $2.15 trillion, and, and commercial and, and industrial bank lending is also at a, a record high. Uh, some claim that Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley has killed community banks, an important source of capital and strength to all of our uh, small businesses and communities. And again, this is false. As this slide indicates, the total number of banks has been declining since the 1980s, long before Dodd-Frank. And, and let's look at what business owners them say, themselves are saying about access to capital in a report released just last month in the National Federation of Independent Business, which former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen often liked to quote and refer to. The NFIB survey of business owners found that only 3% reported that not all of their borrowing needs were not met, and 30% and said all their credit needs were met, and only 2% reported that loans were harder to get. So uh, I, I think it's a myth that Dodd-Frank has crippled business lending and devastated smaller uh, banks. Uh, but I think that we have to move forward in an economy that takes care of everyone, including our rural and underserved communities where it is tremendously difficult to get uh, funding for small businesses. And I'd, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Menashe about CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, uh, that help make capital available to small businesses in, in underserved communities and rural areas. In my district, we have several that are very successful. I want to read them into the record, the Lower East Side Federal Credit Union, the NYU Federal Credit Union, the Community Preservation Corporation, the Community Development Trust, and the Local Initiative Support Corporation. And they work by leveraging uh, private capital to help underserved areas. And how does that leverage work? And what is the approximate return to our government investment in these CDIFs? And I thank my colleagues for supporting CDIFs. Ms. Thank you, mm -hmm. Congresswoman Maloney, for your interest and your support of these important community development financial institutions. When they receive a financial assistance award from the U.S. Treasury's CDFI funds, on, I believe all the ones you mentioned may have profited from those, that forms a kind of permanent capital to which they can lend against. So a million dollar financial institution award is able to be converted into 10 million of borrowings on this. And then in our rural areas, in our native areas, and in areas right in New York City, which are working with uh, new immigrant communities or new businesses that are yet to qualify, they're pre-NASDAQ, they're pre these stages, they build their track record, often financed by CDFIs, not only financing the businesses, but often the facilities that hold them. So this leverage ratio, this is an important role of government. It is hard to grow a mission. How much is the leverage usually? We say 12 to 1. $1, one. 12 out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that may be an undercount. I, I'd like to, to ask Mr. McIntosh very quickly on the listings. Uh, you mentioned that listings are down. Uh, but I'd say that there's not a level playing field on IPOs. I read stories about some countries, they create a business, then they buy the business, and that's their IPO. And uh, also, I'd say that it used to be that companies would, smaller companies would, would go to an IPO. Now they seem to be waiting till they're larger companies. Well, why, why is that happening? But I, I guess the basic question is, uh, uh, what is the benefits for listing in America? And could you comment on how many foreign companies are still coming to America, or do you find foreign companies going elsewhere now? Sure. Um, so I think looking at the IPO data that we see year on year, um, there is definitely an, an increase in the larger companies, the billion dollar plus IPOs, and a decrease in the smaller companies each year that are listing, the less than $250 million companies. Why do you think that is? Um, I, I suspect there's a lot of academic research that's done um, on the reasons for the shrinkage of the outstanding, or the outstanding companies at all. Uh, but I think that the private equity market is better organized now. Um, I think that, that some of the angel investors are much better organized, uh, and so that's making it easier to access that capital. Um, there's probably tax incentives, and also the costs of being public that I think make people resist 
turning themselves into public companies until they're much larger and they have much more economies of scale. Um, on your second point about the internationalization of markets, um, one data point that I would draw your attention to is in NASDAQ we have um, a Nordic uh, venture market called First North, and it's actually grown its listings by 300% in the last 12 or 13 years. So there are countries in the world with much more um, com companies coming to markets and listing in venture type markets, uh, and that's potentially an avenue that we could pursue to get uh, more companies to list in America and stay in America as public markets here. So foreign countries are, are up in listing in America, right? Are American companies going abroad to list? I don't have data on that right now. Okay. I can get back you. to you. you Thank you, Representative Handel. You're yield, uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. I'm going to start with Ms. King, and first, thank you. I am a um, Novartis alum as well, so it's great to, to have you here. Um, I wanted, and I'm going to ask all of you this. Um, as we, as Congress, start to undertake the next version 2.0 of tax cuts, what are your thoughts on the critical components that ought to be included in the next version or the next step in tax cuts and tax reforms, Ms. King? So, as I said in my remarks, we're a pre-revenue company. So for us, the, the critical issues really relate to this issue of NOLs that we were talking about earlier. Um, to be able to get that Section 382 reform, I think, would be very important to us. Um, we look to the day when we're uh, tax po when we're revenue positive, but for us, uh, you understand the industry. We spend many years where we're, we're just we're spending, and so we're accumulating those NOLs. So for us, the critical tax issue is really this NOL issue. Great, thank you, Ms. Mensa. Uh, Congresswoman, you had a wonderful hearing a few weeks back on opportunity zones, which yes. were part of the new of the first tax reform. I would encourage you to keep moving forward. It's rare to get everything right the first time something passes. This has created a quite a lot of excitement in our field, and yet a big hope that those kind of opportunity zones and opportunity funds can have a tighter connection with community development financial institutions and can intensify in the way they reach uh, rural areas, persistently poor areas. So I would encourage you to uh, take another look at how we can deepen that part of the legislation. Okay, thank you, Mr. McIntosh. So I think tax incentives for savers are um, a pretty strong incentive to give to the market to do more saving. And uh, it was mentioned in my introduction, I'm from Sydney, um, a couple of things that Australians have done, uh, and they have a really strong retirement um, system, is uh, the money that you earn, it's a little bit like the 401k system here, goes into the, the, a mutual fund structure tax-free, and you can take it out at, at a lower tax rate when you retire as well, plus on dividends, they've made sure that there's no double taxing of dividends. And I think things like that can incentivize companies to um, return the, the money that they've earned to investors, and the investors can receive those monies uh, on a more after-tax effective uh, basis. Okay, thank you. Um, in Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Metro Atlanta in particular, has become um, a really robust um, environment for startups and even access to capital. And some of that is being driven by um, my observation of some really innovative approaches to how do we get capital, in particular to women entrepreneurs. Georgia is number one in the most uh, um, number of companies that are owned by women-owned companies. And we have some innovative initiatives like the ACE Women's Business Center, um, the Rich Group, and some other um, initiatives. What more can we do to drive that type of, of innovation and thinking and how we can create more access to capital? And maybe Mr. McIntosh and Mr. Ms. Mensa, if we have time. I'll start because you mentioned the access to credit for entrepreneurs, ACE mm -hmm. in Georgia. It's a great powerful group. CDFI yes. that's led innovation throughout the state, actually. Mm -hmm. And again, my recommendation is to uh, a full uh, renewed commitment of $250 million appropriation to the Department of Treasury CDFI fund. ACE wouldn't have grown had it not had the kind of support from the CDFI fund or from the SBA's Community Advantage Program and from the Department of Agriculture's uh, business lending. So I think those are exactly the kind of programs that can reach those women entrepreneurs that can help at many stages. We have community development venture capital funds. Mm -hmm. So I would urge the Congress to keep going. 71 women owned companies have gotten uh, loans and financing and investment through ACE. Through it's ACE. great. So, Mr. McIntosh? 
Yeah, so I, I guess coming from a larger company perspective, mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we hear from our issuers are just that the reporting obligations are, are a big problem just to get over in terms of getting a company going. So. Um, the accounting and uh, reporting obligations, I think, would be one thing to streamline for mm -hmm. new companies um, so that the entrepreneurs are able to focus on growing their business rather than focus on all of the bureaucracy and administration of the companies. Great. Thank you. Ms. King, would you like to add anything there? Well, for us, that speaks to the, the, the specifically the 404B yep. issue. Yep. And um, t uh, to the point that uh, Congresswoman Maloney was making earlier, I think that um, we're talking about a specific provision of Sarbanes-Oxley that would, it would help us greatly if we could retain the exemptions that we got under the JOBS Act so that we don't have to increase the financial reporting obligations beyond what we currently have, which we think are sufficient for transparency for our investors. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Peters, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. King, uh, thank you for uh, talking quite a bit about the Fostering Innovation Act. I'm happy to work with Senator Tillis on that legislation uh, here in the Senate, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to move it forward. You mentioned the strong support it received uh, in the House. Thank you for that. Well, you're welcome, but thank you for what you do in, uh, uh, in your business and, uh, and in bringing this to our attention as to this is an important element uh, for your company. And I think it's important you've talked about it uh, in response to several questions already, but uh, if you could let folks know for the record uh, the fact that you won't have this kind of reporting requirement, which we, I agree is being handled uh, in terms of other types of reporting, and so the transparency is still there. What will that mean for your company, and more specifically, what will it mean for jobs if this bill passes? Yeah. So again, I just want to reiterate the point which you made, which is that we already ha we already have and we already provide what I think are very financial audited financial statements. Right. Uh, um, transparent audited financial statements to our investors. So I think we provide that already. What we're talking about is that extra layer, which is gonna cost us probably about another $600,000 a year. So to us, that's money spent on an extra layer of reporting as opposed to being spent on people that we can hire or research that we can conduct. So it's a real trade-off. We don't have an unlimited pool of capital. So especially your business, which is uh, heavily dependent on research and development. Absolutely. That's money that you can put into basically the research, uh, which will be the seed corn for your next big thing. Hopefully exactly. it will come out of your company is, is your goal. Exactly. So the, the IP market, uh, which we're talking about today, is one that uh, is incredibly important to keep dynamism in the economy. And I have a great deal of concern about the concentration we're seeing in industries all across every industry sector, big companies becoming bigger, buying out companies prior to them uh, having an initial public offering. Mm -hmm. uh, you went public last year, I believe? Uh, 2014. Uh, oh, in 2014. So you, yeah. you've been out for a while. Yeah. Uh, given given the, the issues related with an IPO, which is always complex, more complex than just having a company come in and write you a check, walk us through your company's decision. Why did you decide to go forward with an IPO? Well, to the complexity, if I had time, I would tell you a lot of stories about that. Well, we, I'd like to do that at some have, point. We have a, it's, not, it's, it's not an easy process. But for us, the critical ability to access that capital is what really, is what really made it important to us. Because as a public company, we're, a, we're able to access capital so much easier and so much more quickly than we can through the venture capital um, network. So it, it's, and it opens up a huge opportunity for us to be able to fund the type of research that we need to fund. So it was critical to us to be able to get public, and for that, the Jobs Act was really um, was really important. Um, so I think it really, um, I mean, for, for companies like ours, for biotechs that have to raise so much money, if you can get public, I think generally companies want to do that. It is a, it is a benefit to us. To what extent in your offering uh, were employees included in, in ownership? Was that also a factor uh, in the decision process? Well, every employee in our company gets stock options the day they start. Every employee? Every employee. Regardless of their position? Correct, that's correct. That's an important, it's very important to me that every company, every employee in our company gets stock options. And tell me why. Everybody contributes, and we want to recognize everyone's contribution, and we want to share the um, share the upside. Right. Recognize the contribution and share the upside. Well, I want to explore that further with Mr. Uh, McIntosh, because uh, in response to a, a earlier question, you talked about how uh, uh, folks are investors as well and can benefit uh, as uh, investors in these companies uh, or investors in the economy uh, generally. To me, that's an incredibly important point, and particularly when you look at the, the Tax Act that we just passed, where the vast majority of the tax breaks are basically share buybacks, uh, uh, increased dividends, so it goes to the owners of those companies. 
And yet an awful lot of research uh, shows, and I think Ms. King uh, confirmed that, that having employee ownership on the ground does a great deal for a company, and it actually, most studies show, enhances productivity dramatically because everybody has a, a, a stake in that company. Uh, so my, my question is you and your research that you've done, uh, what, what, how significant is it that employees have a stake in that company and are able to participate in profits, whether it's in stock option plans, profit sharing plans, and others, and does that indeed lead to more productivity in a more dynamic economy? Um, I mean, honestly, I think your experiences are probably better than, than the research that I've read in terms of motivating staff and getting them to connect with the objectives of the business. Um, but from a financial perspective, if the employees have a vested interest in the performance of the company, then they're gonna wanna make the performance of the company go better. And I think that's kind of the key economic driver of giving staff um, a share of the company, whether it's in options or in stock. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Delaney. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to welcome all the guests, including Ms. King, whose business is located in my district. It's uh, nice to have you here. Exactly. Thank you for what you do. Um, I'd like to ask a question, and it, it may be more targeted towards Mr. McIntosh, um, but I'll leave it open for anyone on the panel. One of the big things that concerns me is that if you look at the data, last year about 80% of the professionally managed venture capital in the United States went to 50 counties in this country. And there are 3,000 counties in our country. So about one and a half or 1.6% of the counties got 80% of the professionally managed venture capital, which is considered the smart money doesn't mean it always is making the right bets, but directionally, these are the people who have been hired by the most sophisticated investors in the world to allocate capital to what they view as the most promising businesses in the United States of America. And they have allocated that capital to a very, very small slice of our country. So that's, that's kind of one statistic. The second statistic is that 70% of the kids in the United States of America live in a county where there's no evidence of upward economic mobility meaning the jobs that are being created are not as good as the jobs that used to exist. So you have this situation where there's a dire need of new opportunities, new businesses, particularly ones that create jobs that have decent standard of living in, in the majority of our country, yet a very small slice of our country is getting most of the, the bets that investors are making. So from a pure policy perspective, recognizing, and I'm sure my colleagues talked about things we should do to make it easier to access capital, how we need regulatory relief, how there's too many burdens, and we have to do all kinds of things at the specific kind of tactical level to make sure companies get capital. What do you think from a macro policy agenda we can do so that in 10 or 15 years, those statistics look different? And so that you see a situation where 80% of the professionally managed venture capital is not going to 1.5% of our counties. It would be a huge victory if it went to 20% of our counties. I mean, what can we do so that in 10 years those statistics look different? Um, so I think there's a global trend towards people moving to cities, and that's probably because of the economies of scale of actually getting uh, your, your network and your infrastructure all together in one place. Uh, at the same time, there's always also the trend of, of people working remotely. Yes. Um, so it's possible that the people with the skill sets will actually be able to work away from where the head offices are and, and sort, of, sort of foster that interesting work and innovation and intellectual property in, in the country areas. Um, it's not a very statistically significant sample, but I was on a venture capital company a, a few years ago uh, which actually relocated itself to San Francisco because that's where its venture finance came from. And so potentially... Right, because a lot of the venture capitalists are like, I don't even want to get on a plane anymore. If you want me to invest, I have to be able to drive to your company. Yeah, so potentially what I you're saying them, is, but, you is the companies are, are locating near their finance right. so that they can be um, involved with the companies more, be more closely and manage the company. And you watch Shark sure. Tank, you see that sometimes there's actually a management involvement as well as a financial involvement. Sure. Right. But that specific company, um, half of the board of directors were actually still working remotely. So the skill set was actually still scattered around, sometimes in remote areas of America, 
um, even though what looked like a San Francisco-based company. So, so you, that's a trend you're observing, but what, what do you think we can do to accelerate those trends? Congressman, I'd like to hop in. Please. Because I hope when you invite me back in 2028, we will be celebrating the success of the mediating institutions that are needed to work with traditional VC. There are community development venture capital uh, institutions. I testified to one of them and in Maine. And what we've seen is that when you invest in the CDFIs, whether they're venture capital loan, venture capital associations, loan funds, community banks, right. that is jet fuel for the kind of hyper-local, yes, it's still local, institutions that help companies like Tilson Technology to expand a broadband business. If we want to tackle the scale of what you've mentioned, 70% of the kids in low mobility counties from the Raj Chetty research, we need a bigger scale of investment in the very things that we know will reach those communities. This is a 40-year field of community investors and community development financial institutions know how to make those investments. So I hope that the 2028 solution that we'll be coming back and celebrating is one that talked about what we added to the system. The channels are here. We need to add more fuel to those channels. Yeah, you're asking a very complex question, which has a lot of things to do with education, with infrastructure, with where people live. Because even in Rockville, which is outside of sure. the nation's capital, you know, we talk about the need to incentivize getting venture capital here. Right. right. So, so it is. It is a broad challenge. Because we don't have many of those 50 counties actually, and this. Yeah, which is which, which is, is really surprising, surprising. Yeah. in spite of the strength of our local of our local yeah. uh, economy, and in spite of the national labs that we right. have here in the at university. We have all the assets. You would know. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So I will, I will just add, end with one encouraging note, which is that you do see some venture capitalists now recognizing that good science, good technology, good people are not only in those counties and that there are actually opportunities to invest there that because they may not be as widely known, may be less expensive and therefore you know, good opportunities for investment. So that's also encouraging, I would say. Thank you. Thank Representative you. Comstock, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Richard. I wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, Mr. Delaney's um, comments, but focus on um, uh, not just location, but gender. And so I'm happy we see um, a panel here with, with women, but what is something like two to 3% of all venture capital goes to women, apparently. And I'm sorry, since I'm late, you may have addressed this already. And then of course, the people you're going to pitch is, are, are men often, and I was reading a, um, column in Forbes uh, about a very successful company, uh, Third Love, which uh, this woman is saying, I once went to a meeting with a venture capital firm to pinch, pitch them on my company, Third Love. At the end of the session, a guy told me, sorry, we only invest in things we understand. Um, Third Love is a woman's very successful underwear <laughs> company. Um, I, I think probably Spanx had the same issue. So not to just focus on you know, things like that. Obviously, this goes beyond just understanding um, women's products, but the bigger picture of you know whether it's geographically, we aren't you know the venture capital is uh, not reaching people through in, in in equal ways throughout the country, and certainly there's talent everywhere. I know um, Steve Case has done the Rise of the Rest tour, which I think kind of speaks to a lot of what Mr. Delaney was talking about. So. How do we uh, get the rise of the 50% too? Again, this is, a, this is a challenging question that speaks to education and access and networking and a lot, of, a lot of issues. It's true that almost all the people that I've pitched in my career of raising money, both as a private company and as a public company, they're almost all men. That's true. And, um, and so I, I think it's... Um, I think it's a it's a challenge that over time I hope as more women become investors and more women more, more women become CEOs we begin to kind of seed the future of greater diversity not just gender diversity but diversity in in all respects. Um, so it's a complex question. I know you had some specific um, comments to an earlier question on the same topic. Thank you, Congresswoman. I love the question because we can't leave out half of the. Mm -hmm people in the country in our solution to how to build an innovative and entrepreneurial economy. And I'm proud to represent the community development financial institutions who have overwhelmingly invested in women-owned businesses. I would say two things. First, Congress's ability to support 
the kind of capital that flows close to the ground with our community development financial institutions is critical to reaching women-owned businesses. Second, Congress's protections through the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, through the SBA, that ensure that when you start a company, you're not facing a rapacious kind of financing, that you're able to get the right fair and safe kind of financing to build your business so that you don't get overloaded with the wrong kind of credit. So two things, both the availability of the capital and the fairness and safety of the capital to start pushing forward. I've seen tremendous entrepreneurial potential and much of it led by women and I, I hope we're on the right trend. I know our CDFIs are in place to support those kinds of businesses. Great. Well, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate I know this is an area where <clears throat> a lot of it is just understanding that that discrepancy exists when you hear the point that 1.6% of the counties are getting all of that. It's, it's really, it's a boys club. It's a boys club in, in certain country clubs and it's like there is a rise of talent that we need to embrace all across the country. And I think uh, whether it's racially or, or women or other parts of the country, um, I think that discussion needs to be had at every level, and certainly I think we need to shine a light on that, about that this has been sort of a, a, a problem that has been just not recognized in the media at all. So, and not surprisingly, if we look at the boards of media, <laughs> um, women are not on those boards either, uh, by, in any kind of equitable fashion. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the uh, witnesses for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, appreciate that very much. And then remind members also, should they wish to submit questions for the record, the hearing record will remain open for five business days. As a reminder, Mr. Brown also agreed to answer questions with his testimony submitted. Um, he agreed to answer questions for the record as well. And with that, uh, committee is adjourned. <laughs>